Hello, let's get started. Today we're going to continue on with chapter nine, where we've been talking about the models of the atom. Um, I had ended with, well, in the middle of the bull model of the atom, with a bull model of the atom, named after Neo's bull, um, said that an atom consists of a nucleus with protons and neutrons and electrons orbited at set radii, set radii known as energy levels. And that each radius has a each set radius that can be found with a simple equation and a set energy that can be found with a simple equation. Um, before I get into it, this is a kind of interesting kind of fact. Um, Niels Bull, um, after getting the Nobel Prize, was gifted a house next door to Carlsberg Brewery. Um, it's a little more complicated. It was a residence that was created for the founder of the brewery. And he wasn't exactly gifted the house, but he was granted a lifetime right to live there. Um, the brewery still owned the house, but he was just allowed to live there. Um, and he didn't actually have beer on tap, but he had as limited beer, as limited beer any he wanted that he could just request, and they would bring over kegs or bottles, whatever he requested for life, however much beer he wanted for free, straight from the brewery. It's kind of an interesting fact about him. Um, before I get into continuing on with what I was talking about, though, um, I do want to make a quick announcement. Um, I said this last time, but my office hours today, they should be from three to five. They will only be three to four. If you would like to see me and you are planning on coming at four to five, let me know. I will move some things. Okay. But let's get back into Neo's Bull. Um, so as we were covering last time, he said that all all electrons will exist these set radiuses, these set energy levels. And what we were describing was the idea of emission spectra. That if you remember on Monday, we talked about emission spectra a bit before we talked about Bohr's model of the atom. And what Niels Bohr said is this emission spectra was well, his model of the atom was created to explain this emission spectra, but also that this emission spectra kind of proved his model of the atom. What it says is since only certain energy levels are allowed, since they are quantized, only some energies of emitted photons are allowed. See, keep in mind that the energy of a photon is HF. So only certain free. And what we'll say is when something goes from one energy level to another, what will happen is it'll emit one photon. One, one electron, one photon. Made a big deal about this last time. And oop, that made more display than I wanted to. And what will happen is if you excite an electron, it will jump to a higher energy level. When any time an electron relaxes, we'll emit one photon. We covered this on Monday. I'm just kind of reviewing it again. Um, and there are various different series in hydrogen, known as the Lyman series, Bamo series, and Pashan series, and there's some other ones too, are just showing what emission lines you can see. The Bamo series, the most famous, being the ones invisible, which is any time an electron drops from a higher energy level to the second energy level. That we can see when something drops from three to two as a red line, four to two as a greenish line, and five to two and six to two as violet lines or dark, dark blue. You'll be seeing this in lab, not the lab that opens this week, but the one that opens the week before, or the week after, I mean. Um, and that's the basis of why we believe the bomb, the bull model of the atom, is that these energy levels perfectly correspond mathematically with the energies of the various lines in the hydrogen atom. And so this seems to be the model of the atom. Protons and neutrons are in the nucleus and electrons orbit at set radiuses, set radii. Um, this is also is why absorption spectra works. That absorption spectra was where you put white light at something, it'll absorb certain bands. That's because if you shine white light at it, it'll absorb exactly the bands that correspond to energy levels and it will absorb some photons to excite an electron. And yes, when the electron relaxes, it will release a photon, but it will kind of shoot off in a different direction as shown in this GIF. So you won't necessarily look like the same. Okay. Now this was for hydrogen. Um, 
we can use it to explain lines in other elements. So like helium, argon, neon. We'll all have set emission spectra, but here's the thing. These lines, mathematically, Bull couldn't prove this for anything other than hydrogen. He mathematically said this works for hydrogen, but for even helium, which has two electrons and two protons, his model broke down and it only worked for hydrogen. But they couldn't explain all of the lines. And so the Bull model, although it's a good model for hydrogen, only works for hydrogen. And it kind of is close to what we believe today an atom looks like. And I'm, once again, we'll come back to that. But it doesn't quite work. Also, um, he had the assumption that these energy levels existed because these energy levels must exist because all this works. He didn't actually explain why the energy levels existed, per se. Um, he knew they had to have. And mathematically, I, you can kind of Prove. There's, a, there's a bunch of assumptions made. There was four major assumptions he made. I'm not going to get into the details. It gets complicated. But he made four major assumptions without any explanation why. But in general, if you excite a gas, you'll get this emission spectra. And for hydrogen, we can directly base it off the shape of a hydrogen atom, the structure of the atom. For helium, argon, and neon, we can assume that it's similar. We just don't know the details. Um, fun bit with this, though, this does mean when you excite a gas, you will emit these spectrum lines, no matter what they are. Different elements will actually glow different colors. The reason why is what you're seeing is the collection of the lines. Hydrogen looks purplish. It's not shown here because it's a mixture of two violet lines, a green and a red. But helium, which looks a little more pink normally, they'll look kind of white there, looks more pink because it has a lot of blue and red mixing together. Neon just has a lot of red lines, so it looks pretty red. Um, also, I keep saying you excite a gas by you know putting electricity through it. You could also excite something by setting on fire. That's how fireworks works. Why different colors of fireworks are different colors. It's just if you ex put a chemical on fire, it'll glow a various color. It's because we're exciting electrons. They're jumping to a higher energy level. And when they relax, releasing photons. Okay. Now, before I get to the modern model of the atom, which is only going to be like the last five slides of today's class, um, before I get to the modern model of the atom, I would like to talk about some of the ways we got there, um, how we figured out this to be true. Uh, Actually, no, that's not quite the way to do it. I want to get into why we know the model of the atom is not correct. Um, but before even that, actually, let me rephrase how I said that. I want to talk about some uses of this. That's really what I want to do. Some reasons that this model of the atom is really, really, really useful, these energy levels, that even though we know it's not quite right, that if we use this model, it has a lot of uses. Because Although these set radii, as we've described, are not the whole truth, these energy levels do exist. That all electrons exist in various energy levels. In fact, the study of electrons in various energy levels is called spectroscopy. It's just the study of the emission spectra of something, that when you excite it and the electrons relax, the emission spectra. This is actually what my PhD was on. Um, for five years, I was a spectroscopist. I shot lasers at things, saw how they glowed, and see what they did. Um, it's useful to get a lot of properties of materials. Um, it's the basis of quantum computing. Um, but the general idea is you excite something, the electrons jump to a higher level. When they relax, they emit photons. And this idea, as I said, the Bull model has some issues, but that is still true. Although the Bull model only works for hydrogen, it, we can still say you excite there's still energy levels in all atoms. We still believe that today. I might change the way I do this slide moving forward. Um, this is how microwave ovens work. Microwaves are a type of electromagnetic wave. A microwave is the same thing as light, just a different frequency. What it is, is the microwave have um, such a frequency that they kind of correspond to um, resonant frequencies in water, fat, and oil. And so if you shoot microwaves at organic material, it causes things to vibrate. 
uh, causing the vibrate, causing the heat up. But it's actually the same idea as um, as spectroscopy. What it is is that you excite you. It's kind of the same as an uh, absorption spectra. You shoot. Um, high-powered electromagnetic waves at something, they excite the electrons, the electrons jump to a higher energy level. When they jump to a higher energy level, they have more energy. More energy means higher temperature. In fact, how they're emitted is, how they're emitted is you shoot electrons at a piece of metal. Uh, oh, sorry, that's x-rays. I got ahead of myself. Um, how they're emitted is exciting, a piece inside the microwave, and by exciting it, releasing these photons. I got ahead of myself. X-rays also use this idea. X-rays, what they all, and sorry, X-rays has an interesting basis of their naming. X-rays are so called because when they were first discovered, no one knew what the hell they were. The X was just a placeholder of just to be like unknown, like these rays exist. Uh, we now know X-rays are also electromagnetic waves. How they work is you shoot electrons at a piece of metal. When you shoot electrons at a piece of a metal, X-rays are re released. The reason why is when you shoot electrons at a piece of metal, those electrons excite the metal. The electrons jump. The electrons in the metal jump to a higher energy level. The second they jump to a higher energy level, they say, "Shit, I don't want to be here." Relax back down. When they relax, we emit electromagnetic waves. Both of these microwaves actually is the same idea. Anytime you excite an electron, right when it gets excited, it'll then move back to where it started. That's what's emitting this light. It's not the electrons being excited, it's the electrons relaxing. Everything wants to be in the lowest possible energy level. And so when you excite the electrons, they'll jump up, and then when they relax, pew, light. That is what an X-ray is. So also lasers work. Um, laser is actually an acronym, though not many people realize it. It stands for light amplification by simulated emission of radiation. Um, what it is, is uh, there's such a thing called spontaneous emission. You see, if you excite an atom, an atom, the electrons will jump to a higher energy level, and then they would relax, release a photon. But sometimes something called spontaneous emission happens, which is just sometimes they just kind of jump up on the road. Well, you have to give energy, but sometimes due to ambient energy, they jump up on their own and then relax. And if you excite something, normally you just get spontaneous emission. Um, that if you excite something, they'll jump up to some random energy level and they'll relax down. And that's why you normally get multiple lines when you excite something is because all the electrons are going up to different spots. Going from, some are going from one to two, some are going from one to three, some are going from one to four, and they relax. Some of them go back to one, some of them go like from four to three, then to one, some go like four to two, then to one. It's kind of random and disorganized. However, people worked out something called stimulated emission, which is if you excite a photon, excite an electron with the exact same wavelength as the emission, you actually get twice as much energy out. Uh, the, why this is gets a little complicated. It kind of seems like it should break conservation of energy. But if you excite the um, atom with the exact amount of energy that is going to do when it relaxes, you can guarantee exactly what it's going to excite to. So if I just shit, put a shit ton of energy in, some will go from one to two, some to one to three, some to one to four, some to one to five. But if I give the exact amount of energy that matches when you go from first energy level to second energy level, that will guarantee the atom or the electron will go from the first energy level to the second energy level. This is going to get a little complicated. I'm not going to put lasers on homework or the exam, but it's kind of an interesting thing. So hopefully you understand this next bit I'm going to get into. And if you don't, don't worry about it too much. But if you want to understand it better, let me know. I'll try to explain it. But some substances have something called a metastable excited state. See, most things, when you excite the electrons, the second they get excited, they say, fuck this noise, I'm going home, and go straight back down. When they go straight back down, releasing a photon. Things like ruby crystals, carbon dioxide, some mixtures of helium and nitrogen have what's called a metastable state. And when you excite an electron, they'll go and say, cool, I'm on vacation, and we'll hang out there. Not forever, just a little while, and they say, oh, no, time to go home again, and we'll relax, releasing a photon. What happens in these materials is you can cause what is called a population inversion. 
which is you excite a whole bunch of electrons and you get them to stay a little while in their metastable state and not instantly relax. The thing is, if you excite something with a stimulated photon, you'll cause one electron to relax. And once, if you get a whole bunch of electrons and you get them all in these metastable states, you excite all these electrons and keep them from relaxing. The second you relax one, the rest will turn and look at and go, oh shit, we're not supposed to be here. And they'll all relax at once. And so if you can go and excite all of these electrons and get them to stay up, you can cause them all to relax at once. This will cause a whole bunch of photons to be emitted in the exact same direction with the exact same wavelength. And that's what a laser is. That's why a laser is directional. That a laser doesn't spread out light like a light bulb. It points it all in the straight line. That it's, I'm missing my hand, there we go. That it's all in a straight line. The reason it's all in a straight line is because it was all going, it's all being emitted right in the same path. Also, it only has one wavelength because it's all from the same relaxation of energy levels. I mean, in general, lasers are pretty useful. Um, high energy lasers can cut things, destroy things. Low energy can just use to point at things like my laser pointer that I would be using if we were in person. But that's the general idea. Now, after that side tangent of things that are explainable and possible with the bull model, because that's really what I was getting at there, the um, microwaves, x-rays, and lasers. Let's explain why the bull model isn't right. See, all of that is that works because of the bull model. We got a nucleus. We have electrons orbiting at set radius. But here's the thing. It's that set radius. Energy levels do exist. When an electron orbits a um, nucleus, it has an exact amount of energy. Those energy levels we believe in. But that set radius idea is a little more complicated. And the first person to really start working this out is a man named Werner Heisberg. And what it is, is when you make a measurement, you always have a certain amount of uncertainty, right? That if I want to measure, oh, I broke my ruler the other day, but I have another one right here. If I want to measure the length of something, and I say, okay, it's this many centimeters long, I have a certain amount of uncertainty. How accurate I am in that measurement. How accurate I am in that measurement completely based off how nice of a ruler I have. And in classical physics, aka just measuring things, there's no limits. Sorry, that ruler is actually the base of my keyboard. I'm trying to get it back on. There we go. Um, you can be, make as many as small as you want. But in 1927, Werner Heisenberg introduced the uncertainty principle. And what he says is impossible to know the exact location and velocity of any particle. Now, there's two major parts to the uncertainty principle. The mathematical part, which I'll get to in two slides, and the logical part, which I'll do first and then come back to. You see, Let's say you want to measure the position and momentum of an electron. If you want to measure the position of an electron, you're going to have to look at it. If you want to look at something, how looking at something works, right, is that light hits an object, bounces off, hits our eyes. That's how we look at things. If you want to look at an electron, you need to shine a light on it. It's a little more complicated, but that's the general idea. If you shine light at an electron, Photons can deflect electrons. Now, this idea alone is kind of weird, that a photon can, inter can deflect electrons. Something called Compton scattering. Um, I'm not going to get into it at this level. Just trust me, it's possible. And so if you look at an electron, you are going to change where it's moving. Therefore, the process of figuring out where an electron is, you will change its velocity. And so if you know where an electron is, you have fundamentally made its velocity something different. Because if you look at it, you shine light at it, that fucks up the velocity. He also said the opposite is true. You can measure velocity of something like we did with the photo gates in labs by putting two gates and seeing how long it takes to pass through. 
if you do that for an electron, what you're going to find is you have the two gates. You can figure out when it passed through both. But at that point, it's moved off on its own. That by measuring the velocity, you no longer know its position. And so what he said is if you know the position of something, you cannot know its momentum. And if you know the momentum of something, you cannot know the position. Because the process of measuring one of those throws off the other. That the process of measuring position throws off, he really said momentum, not velocity. But moment, velo, momentum is just mass times velocity. But the process of learning the momentum changes the position. And the process of, change, of knowing the position changes the velocity. And he actually put it to math. This equation looks very complicated. I swear it's not that complicated. Um, this weird symbol here is a lowercase sigma, this guy. I don't know why I'm using yellow today since yellow doesn't show up well. This guy is a sigma. Sigma means the uncertainty. And what this says is the mass of a particle times the uncertainty in velocity times the uncertainty in position is h over 4 pi. Where uncertainty is how accurate you measure something. And what this says is the less uncertainty you have in velocity, the more uncertainty you have in position, and vice versa. That is how this works. If you know where something is, you don't know where it's going. If you know where something is going, you don't know where it is. Okay? Any questions there? Now, Heisenberg and a friend of his named Schrodinger, we'll come back to Schrodinger a lot, but for now, um, went one step further with this with a thought experiment. And you've probably heard of Schrodinger's cat. I don't know how well you understand Schrodinger's cat, but I'm going to try to explain Schrodinger's cat. And what they were saying is what the uncertainty principle gets at is the process of measuring something changes it. The reason the uncertainty principle exists is that if you look at an electron, you change where the electron is. And what they say is observation causes causality. And Schrodinger came up with the following cat, oh, the following cat, the following thought experiment. Schrodinger said, let's say, for example, you put a cat in a sealed box with a vial of poisonous gas. It's not recommended to do. There's a lot of reasons why this wouldn't work in the real world, but bear with it. And you put this cat in a box with a vial poisonous gas. And the vial is attached to a device that has a 50-50% chance of letting the gas out. And there's a 50-50% chance of the vial of, of, of gas being opened. And if the vial of gas is opened, cat dies. And for some reason, this box is in such a way that you cannot tell what happened inside it without opening it up. And Schrodinger says, you put the cat in the box. There's a 50-50% chance the cat dies. There's a 50-50% chance the cat lives. What Schrodinger postulated is that until you open the box, while the box is closed, the cat is both alive and dead. You cannot say the cat is alive because only a 50-50 chance it's alive. You cannot say the cat is dead because there's only a 50-50 chance the cat is dead. And what he said is the, the cat is neither dead nor alive at the time. That the cat is in a superposition of states. It's both, it's alive and dead until you open the box. Once you open the box, then you know. The process of opening the box, that's what kills the cat. Oh, that's what saves the cat. That it's opening the box that lets you find out what happened. And what he's say, getting at here, the reason of this, is that observation affects the measurement. That everything can be anything until you observe it. It is the process of us looking at something, observing something, measuring something that makes it become a state. That until you look at something, it can be any, all devices are possible. I mean, it kind of boils down to, um, 
Well, no, that's the general idea. I'll play a video on it too. See if this explains it any better. Um, I've always kind of liked this video. Um, and see if this helps make it make sense. Because it's a kind of a weird idea. This wouldn't be a YouTube channel without a cat video. So without further ado, we present Schrodinger's Cat. I'm sure you've heard some version of this famous thought experiment. You put a cat in a bunker with some unstable gunpowder that has a 50% chance of blowing up in the next minute, and a 50% chance of doing nothing. The gunpowder is Einstein's version, Schrodinger preferred poisonous gas. But whatever. So until we look in the bunker, we don't know whether the cat is dead or alive. And when we do look, it is either dead or alive. So if we repeat the experiment enough times with enough cats and bunkers and gunpowder, we'll see that half the time, Kitty survives, and half the time, Kitty goes bye-bye. The quantum mechanical interpretation is that before we look, the cat is in a superposition. It's both dead and alive. And our act of looking forces nature's decision. So our curiosity kills the cat. But what about the cat's perspective? Well, the cat either sees the gunpowder explode or not. So inside the bunker, we actually have these two possibilities. The powder explodes and the cat sees it explode, or the powder doesn't explode and the cat doesn't see it explode. There's no option, the powder explodes and the cat doesn't see it explode. So the cat's reality becomes entangled with the outcome of the experiment. And it's our observation of the experiment that forces nature to collapse to one option or the other. But we're like the cat too. Either the cat dies and we see it dead, or the cat lives and we see it alive. So who's observing us to force nature to collapse to one reality? Or do both possibilities happen in parallel within a larger multiverse? This collapsing to one reality problem is one of the biggest unanswered questions in quantum physics. So for Kitty's sake, can I has answer please? Yeah, this all gets into multiverse theory. Shit gets weird. Now this is a problem with the Bohr model because the Bohr model says the electrons orbit at a set radius. And I didn't get into the math of it, but just trust me. It also says they orbit at a set velocity. That if they didn't orbit at a set velocity, mathematically, it wouldn't have worked. And Heisenberg and Schrodinger just said, you can't know that. You can't know with where these electrons are and how fast they're moving. The process of you figuring that out will change that. So there must be something else going on with the Bohr model. Now, around the same time, there's another famous person I'm going to talk about. Light, which was thought as a wave, can be a particle. That's what Einstein said. And then people said, well, what, what defines a particle then? Can anything be a wave then? Why isn't the, if light is a wave in a particle, why isn't an electron a wave in a particle? And people are like, oh, shit, that is true. In 1925, a man named Louis de Broglie said that all metal can be a particle in a wave, so-called de Broglie waves. And he said that he, you, he could prove that electrons have wave-like properties. It was actually proven in 1927 because people found that electrons can make diffraction patterns just like how lasers can. It's how electron microscopes work. And it says any particle can have wave-like particles. That light is wave-like yeah, wave -like, um, properties. There's an the idea that light is both a particle and a wave. It's a particle, that's how it moves through space. It's a wave, that's why we have colors. That's true for everything. All things can be treated as a particle and a wave. Fundamentally, how we understand matter doesn't work. We don't have a way to think of it. So instead we say, eh, sometimes a particle, eh, sometimes a wave, because that's simpler than finding something new that we don't understand. And he said, that the wavelength of any particle can be found as doing Planck's constant divided by the momentum. Well, keep in mind, momentum is mv. And so we can find the wavelength of any material. Now note, the Planck's constant is a very small number. And what this means is that we cannot see the wave-like particles of something unless it is very, very small like an electron. Electrons are very easy to see the wave-like properties, but a full-size object, not so much. For example, let's say 
let's say I have an electron and a baseball. And for both of them, I can say, if they were moving at these set velocities, what would there be the wavelength if we treated them like a wave? You see, if you want to find the wavelength, if you're treating like a wave, you'd say the wavelength is h over p or h over mv, same thing. For an electron, I would just say the wavelength of an electron's wave would just be h divided by the mass of an electron times the velocity of an electron. I will note in the problem, I did not give the mass of an electron. It has a known value. I would not expect you to know it. I would give it if needed. When you do this math, you still get a pretty tiny number. But this value is 12.1 nanometers. That's the same as ultraviolet light. That electrons, you have to deal with the wave-like property. Now, something in the real life, like someone throwing a baseball, if you try to put those numbers in there, you get something times 10 to the negative 34th. This number is so small, it's meaningless. We don't have to worry about the wave-like properties of like, you know, something like this that I'm holding in my hand. Because it's so big, so heavy compared to an electron, and moving so much slower than an electron moves that it doesn't come into play. But for very small particles like electrons, it's very important that light can be treated as a wave. But our goal once again is to talk about the atom. So let's finally get back to that. You see, Bohr, as I said before, made some assumptions when he made his model of the atom. He also only looked at hydrogen, one electron, one proton. And he couldn't get his equations to work for anything with more electrons or more protons. And also, as I said before, it violates the uncertainty principle. He also made a series of assumptions, um, no really, one of them being quantized states, one of them being that those set energy levels. And he said, hey, guys, there's set energy levels. And people are like, why are there set energy levels? And he goes, oh, there has to be. However, Schrodinger, you know, that cat guy from five slides ago, figured out why. Schrodinger said, you know what? Bohr's model is close, but it's a little more complicated. Oops, shit, I didn't mean to hit that bit on the keyboard. But it's a little more complicated. You see, if we look at Bohr's model, what we need to say is that it's electron could be a wave. And if electron could be a wave and has the uncertainty principle, we can't know where an electron is and how fast it's moving. And he created what is called the Schrodinger equation. This right here is the Schrodinger equation in its simplest form. It is the Hamiltonian of the wave function equals energy times the wave function. This is the one of the most complicated equations in all of physics. That written right there is the same as it written like this, and that is still a simplified version of this equation. What it is, it simply says kinetic energy plus potential energy of the wave function equals total energy of the wave function. I'm not going to go into this in detail. This literally, this equation was one entire class for me at graduate level. But what he says is let's Keep, let's treat the electron as a wave. And instead of saying its position as a particle, let's find its position as a wave. And this pitchfork looking symbol is called the wave function. It mathematically represents everything about the particle, where it is, how fast it's moving, and all that. And he's and actually this equation finds that energy levels can be sub split into sub energy levels, uh, which we're going to get into and again the chemistry a little bit, but sub bands S P D F states. We'll talk about them a little bit in passing, but we're not going to go into depth in them. That's for a chemistry class, a full chemistry class, since we are doing chemistry now. And he made his own new model of the atom. This model of the atom is the present belief on the model of atom. It is called the cloud model or the quantum model. And what it is, is electrons move as a wave. And he said the reason for the Bohr energy levels, the reason for the set radiuses, is that we can't just say that an electron is a particle, but it's a wave. And if an electron is a wave, the wave function has to match itself to be 
complete. What I mean is if I took this into a radius and put it into a circle, the if I put this into a circle, I right now don't have things lined up. But if I put it right here, my wave lines up. This is a possible radius. If I see making this smaller, my wave function doesn't line up. My wave function doesn't line up. My wave function doesn't line up. Right here, my wave function lines up. That is a possible radius. And he said the reason for the set, set radiuses. Um, I, sorry, I got to get rid of that explains Bohr's fourth assumption. I didn't list the assumptions of this class. Is that what we're doing is we're saying these radiuses, they, um, they exist because that's where the wave function lines up. And he said that's the reason for Bohr's energy levels. That Bohr's energy levels exist because light is a wave. Oh, sorry, that electrons are a wave. But he also said you really can't actually know what the radius is. That's what the uncertainty principle says. And the reason it's called the cloud model is what we say is that the bow radius is the location of most probable. You see, when an electron orbits a proton, it actually does orbit at random radiuses. But there's areas that have set probabilities. If you square the wave function, that'll give the most probable location of an electron at any given moment. And in fact, if you solve the Schrodinger equation for hydrogen, you'll find that it'll say the most probable location of an electron is 0 0.053 nanometers. That is the Bohr radius. It actually agrees mathematically. And electrons can be at any radius, as we originally said. They're just much, much, much more likely to be at the set radius of the energy level. And then also, as I said before, it proved that there's other substates. And the weird thing is, some of them aren't round. Some of them have weird shapes. And I would say the electrons either over here or over there, but not in between. Now, Bohr model is a good approximation. Um, it's easier to visualize um, than the cloud model that's just like they have weird shapes and things happen. But that's the general idea here, is that the electrons have these energy levels. These energy levels actually have sub-energy levels to get complicated. And they sh show where an electron probably is. Questions? OK, I'm going to stop there. We're 10 minutes early today. Um, next chapter, we'll get even further into chemistry. But this is the basis of the beginning of it. Um, hopefully, this made some sense. If not, please let me know. As I said, this stuff is weird as hell. Um, other than that, have a good day.